Um, welcome back to the Vermont House Human Services Committee, and we were we are continuing our testimony on S74, an act relating to modifications in Vermont's patient choice at end of life law. And we have with us two witnesses to I think, respond to some more of the technical or other aspects of the bill. And let's start with uh, Charity Clark, who's chief of staff for the um, attorney general's office. Welcome. Thank you very much for having um, us today. I don't think I'll be very long, but I just wanted to briefly say a couple of things. The first is that um, we support this bill as written. We did work with the committee on the Senate side on um, a suggested change that we like. So I wanted to point that out to you so that you'll know the change that, that we had suggested. And it was for the section 5283A5A, which is under the requirements, getting the physician determined that the patient and we had suggested that the language and a physician's physical examination of the patient be included. Mm -hmm. And we uh, got that from our criminal division, um, just so you know where it's coming from. The idea being that at some point in the journey of this patient and doctor or medical professional, there was a physical examination. Mm -hmm. Not that it needs to be made at a certain time, but that the diagnosis did involve some sort of physical examination. And I, I listened um, today to um, Dr. Leading it Barnett, she's very um, really insightful um, and often moving testimony that, that she gives. And she you know, so articulately pointed out that she usually is making diagnoses based on using her eyes and her ears. Um, and this is more to provide context and those things that just eyes and ears maybe aren't gonna be able to do on um, telemedicine. So we asked that to be um, added. We're happy the way that it looks now. So we would ask that it remain there, but happy to answer questions about that or if there's any concerns, I'm not sure if it's come up in the course of your testimony, but. Well, one of the things that had come up was um, whether or not, you know, was a legal question and whether or not, and you started out your testimony saying that the AG's office um, supports this a law um, as long as we keep certain language, which is already in the bill, and that's language on page two. Yes, four. Sorry. Well, sorry. I have the um, I have the official, so I don't know what page it's on for you. Page two, yes. Part, okay. Okay. Page yeah. two of ours, where it says the physician determines that the patient and then suffering a terminal condition based on the physician's um, review of the patient's relevant medical records and a physician's physical examination of the patient. So at some point in time, there yes. needs to be a physical examination. Right. The patient is what I understand you wanted to um, have clarified. Yes. That's the point I was trying to make about the telemedicine. Was both being telemedicine? Both of, well, um, both of those could be there at some point in time. <laughs> um, whether it is, the, the, the I think, um, before, um, because how's this? You come to me and I'm a doctor and um, I'm not, um, I choose not to participate in this. And so I do not want to have the conversation with you about exercising. I've done the physical exam and um, there has been a physical exam. So I think that, so it, it, it I believe it, it maintains one, that there is a physical exam at some point in this process and two, it respects the ability that we that we are not forcing anyone to participate who does not want to. It, it also is, at a, the moment in time is a diagnosis. So <clears throat> the physician determined that the patient was suffering a terminal condition based on the review of the patient's relevant medical records and a physical exam. So the di that's the diagnosis portion. So, yeah. Um, so when I first read this, I'm like, why is it crossing it out in one spot and putting it in another? And then, you know, on closer reading, I think I understand what it says, but I think it's open to misinterpretation. How so? Um, well, it feels like it's open to misinterpretation that it has to be the prescribing physician of the medication. It seems, I mean, I know that that's not what your intent is. Um, 
I think what I'm we're envisioning and and you know having heard the testimony that others have provided in this committee and and across the, the hallway, if you will. Um, I think the idea is say I have a you know a patient, I'm a doctor and I have a, a physician patient relationship and I diagnosed my patient with terminal illness three years ago mm -hmm. with a physical exam. Yeah. And then we're in I mean, we're in COVID in my imagination, we're in COVID and I don't physically see them, although I'm treating them through telemedicine for, for years, but I was there, I had the context, <clears throat> I performed the physical exam and I'm, you know, I've checked that box. It doesn't need to happen, you know, the month before this person is going to, you know, reach a point when they want to take the medicine. You know, it doesn't have to be at that point in time. It's just some point in time that that physical exam has occurred. And, and I'm presuming that there's ellipsis here. So I know there's something that comes before it, but um, that it has to be related to the qualifying condition, the, the, the terminal illness. Well, I think that that's already in there. Yeah, was suffering a terminal illness, and then it goes on from, from there, the determination. There's yeah necessarily a relationship between illness and the next steps that are taken. I still have a question mark in my head, but okay. I, thank you. Um, are there other uh, representative This is just a question, pretty much a legal question, I guess. Yeah. I mean, if somebody totally apart from this bill, but somebody commits suicide, uh, does it end? The insurance that the person may have, to the best of my knowledge, that's denied because the person took their own life. Is that true, or maybe that's changed over the course? Like life insurance, I yeah. will. I would have to. I would want to look at the policy. A good lawyer would read the policy. I'm not. I did not come prepared to answer that question. I'm oh, sorry. I'm curious, because I know apparently in 39 we have a provision where uh, somebody can't be denied their insurance as a result of. Uh, Participating in this program is my. I was just curious about somebody taking suicide at random. You know what I mean? And, right. uh, whether my understanding was that it negated their, <laughs> but I was just curious. If we didn't know that I I don't off the top of my head. It sounds like you're familiar with the statute, but yeah. Um, Thank you. I don't know if legislative council wants to. To comment, I believe in the underlying law, the birth certificate does not, it, this is not death by suicide. This is the, the diagnosis is um, the, the medical condition. Right, the death certificate would state the underlying medical condition. Um, but I think it sounds like Representative Rosenquist's question is not in the context of the bill so much as life insurance generally and whether suicide, death by suicide, um, yeah, I was looking at the differentiation there. I mean, this yeah, I think it obviously. depends on. It probably depend on the policy, and you may want to hear from the Department of Financial Regulation, or I can connect you with folks at the Department of Financial Regulation who would be familiar with life insurance policy terms. If that'd be helpful. Thank you. There was one other area that I wanted to touch on. Um, this more an observation that I wanted to make. I did make it on the Senate side. The change wasn't made, that's fine, but I just wanted to make the observation so that if you folks wanted to look at it, um, I, I, was, I would be remiss if I didn't mention it. There are a number of steps that the physician has to, to do. It's like a checklist. And if these things are done, then there's no liability. But the bill adds, and in my reading of it, an extra step. And the, and the step is good faith. I'm sorry? Good faith. Good faith is implicit now. The bill introduces it as an explicit consideration. And I wonder whether that is meant to, um, that was the, the, the legislature's intention. So for example, I, you know, I'm the physician, I have my checklist, I've made the diagnosis, I've done this, the time has passed, check, 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 check. And then there's good faith. Do, does that have to be proven somehow before I'm, you know, free of liability? Why did the legislature introduce the good faith language explicitly rather than just having it remain implicit? Um, and I just, I don't know if it was intentional to add like an, an extra step that all these things were done and then next box, they were done in good faith. Does that need to be proven as, as the medical examiner looking at it? You know what I mean? Rather than it just being implicit. 
So I flag it for you. I don't know that it needs to be changed, but it's just something that you know we noticed and I would be remiss if I didn't mention. Good question. Okay. I would agree 100%. And uh, you, you brought this up and you started your, because um, not everyone was in the room when you started your initial testimony. And what was your initial testimony? That we support the bill as written. <laughs> um, and just for kicks, I did pull out my ancient copy of Black's Law Dictionary and I photocopied <laughs> good faith. So, um, so if you were curious, I just thought, well, I was here next to the photocopier, which I am not always am because I'm at home usually. Um, when I testify, I thought I would just bring that over. So I'll leave it for you if you're curious, but wanted to just flag it. But yes, we support the bill. Thank you. Um, we have a question from Representative McFawn. Thank you, Madam Chair. I could not, uh, I, I do not understand what was just said. I, could, I couldn't understand what the witness said. That's a she used term. some term that I couldn't hear. Right. Uh, the term is good faith. In, and where is that in the in the, uh, the 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 new version of S seventy four? It's very close to the end, okay. under limitations on actions. Topper, you'll find that on, on page, on the bottom of page four um, in section three. Okay. It's the last sentence on, on page four. Okay. So for example, if it just said um, blah, 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 or professional disciplinary action for acting in compliance with the provisions of this chapter, instead of in good faith compliance. Good faith, I would argue, is implicit right now and this sort of introduces it as an explicit thing. It just made me wonder. The bill looks great as it is too. So. Okay, thank you. And I think that's, those are good, that's a good, oh, sorry, uh, Tapper, continue. So that, I, that, that answers, uh, there must be some uh, legal, meaning with good faith that I don't know. So. I could read this to you to give you a sense, but I don't know that how clarifying it will be. Okay. Yeah. Oh, me too? Wait, guys, I got old in the pandemic and now I wear glasses. Um, <laughs> good faith is an intangible and abstract quality with no technical meaning or statutory definition. And it encompasses, among other things, an honest belief the absence of malice and the absence of design to defraud or to seek an unconscionable advantage and on an individual's personal good faith is a concept of his own mind an inner spirit and therefore may not conclusively be determined by his protestations alone. And everyone wishes they went to law school so they could <laughs> write flowery language like that, but there you have it. Good faith. So, and thank you. And perhaps you could um, leave that with us so that we could scan it and, um, and put it on our web page so that we know where it's from if we have um, further questions or want to uh, make changes uh, to that. Because uh, I, of course, was going to run and, and ask the doctors what that meant. If there was something in terms of their process that they go through, that there is something um, related to what I would say medical ethics mm -hmm. and whether that is what is being referenced here. Yep. Um, but um, thank you. And uh, other questions for um, the Attorney General's office? Oh, I think Teresa had it. Oh, you did. Oh, sorry. I just, <laughs> okay. There's so many to your left. Representative Wood. So, in, in that same paragraph where we're referencing good faith, um, I, um, so would you? Um, do you believe that the, the phrase no physician, nurse, pharmacist, or other person licensed, certified, or otherwise authorized to deliver law, uh, deliver, authorized by law to deliver healthcare services, that, that is a um, sufficient clause to capture nurse practitioners, you know, advanced practice nurses, you, you know, essentially people who... Um, I guess one, one of the questions that I have is that um, 
Well, I guess they're bound. Sorry, I'm talking out loud. I'm asking That's questions okay. in my head. Um, they're they're also bound by their um, license in terms of what they're able to practice. So um, I think I've answered my own question. <laughs> oh, you're good. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Uh, yes. Legislative Council. Legislative Council. Jennifer Carvey, Legislative Council again. So the existing statute that this one would be that this section would be amending is 18 U.S.A. 52. 85 and in subsection B of that section, it already introduces this concept of good faith. Um, so, it, it, in existing law, a healthcare facility or healthcare provider shall not subject a physician, nurse, pharmacist, or other person to discipline, suspension, loss of license, loss of privileges, or other penalty for actions taken in good faith reliance on the provisions of this chapter or refusal to act under this chapter. So, I think having the reason that this language is in here is it's consistent with what's already in this section. So it's okay. reliance instead of compliance. It's good faith compliance in the bill and good faith reliance in the statute. So interesting. I didn't realize it was in there. Um, we'll, we'll look to legislate. I actually didn't hear that. I'm having trouble with my hearing. <laughs> okay. Yes, Representative Wood. Uh, um, uh, Jen, so since that's in this part of the statute already, is there a reason to say it again? Subsection B is really about what somebody <laughs> employs, so a healthcare facility or healthcare provider not subjecting their employees um, to negative outcomes. The language that would be added is about civil or criminal liability or professional disciplinary action from a regulatory board. So I do think it's addressing something that is missing from the existing law. Um, the language in subsection, new subsection C is um, talking about good faith compliance. So complying with the provisions as opposed to relying on the provisions. It's looking at it from a, a slightly different perspective because it's about liability as opposed to um, sort of employment related. Provisions, but you could you could change the word compliance or to reliance or reliance to compliance. You want it to be consistent, but I just wanted to flag that good faith was not a new concept in this statute. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and are there other? Um, this has been um, helpful. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, and. Uh, Carl, I want to say. Um, uh, you didn't say you didn't do anything, but um, I have just gotten. Um, uh, and if you want DFR to come in, they're happy to. Uh, and I will um, post to this um, email. Um, it is from DFR and section. 5287 and 5292. This Department of Financial Regulation. Regul oh, DFR. DFR regulation, yes, our regulation. I think it was somewhat unrelated, like in the bill, it's clear, okay, for this procedure. Anyway, they, they would, um, um, if you would like them to come in, they're offering to come in. Um, um, the language is an important protection and clarification on how the medical aid in dying law interacts with insurance underwriting practices. Um, I will have this, I will post this, um, you know, the cut from I this. Know, I don't know other people feel. I mean, I was just curious about okay. the question, but I, you know, I, uh, well, we, we try to answer your stuff. questions. So, what's that? I said we try to answer your questions, or at least. Well, I know, I appreciate that. Yeah. So um, if you, um, do you want, DFR to come in? If we have time, that'd be great. But I, okay. I, I don't want to prolong the whole process here either. So okay. Thank you. Um, uh, our next, we have Theo Kennedy. Well, good morning, Madam Chairwoman and members of the committee. It's an honor to be here. I just have a brief contribution on behalf of the Vermont Retail Druggists uh, on S74, and also in my capacity as a private attorney during which time I represented uh, Smiling Steve Pharmacies in 
and drafted the agreement that's been used since the passage of Act 39, uh, when the language in 5285, limitations on actions, uh, was written as it currently is. Um, so um, I think you had requested that S Smiling Steve be here in person. He regrets not being able to be here. What, I, what he asked me to do was read his letter into the record and then maybe speak just briefly to our support. Uh, and I'm here on a very narrow part of this, specifically the limitations on actions uh, on page four of five of your draft uh, mm -hmm. that we were just discussing. Does that sound all right? So I'll read a letter in and then refer briefly to why we support that language and then see if there are any questions. Does that sound proper, Madam Chairwoman? Uh, yes. Um, Mr. Kenny, that sounds perfect. Um, if we do not already have a copy of the letter, if you could uh, forward that to um, the committee through Julie Tucker, that would be appreciated. appreciated. Yes, thank you. I had asked for it to be sent and I don't think it was sent yet, so I'll make sure it is. Thank you. Uh, okay, so um, the, the letter reads as follows, um, dated today, uh, dear Representative Pugh, uh, on behalf of Vermont, and I'm gonna now read a several paragraph letter. On behalf of Vermont Smile and Steve's Pharmacies, I am writing regarding Senate Bill 74 related to the immunity provision of Act 39. Together with my sons, Jason and Jeffrey Hochberg, our pharmacy has worked with the patients who choose to use Act 39 for over three years. We have witnessed the suffering of patients at the end of their lives, and I've heard gratitude from patients and families when we provide a means to end that suffering. We believe that Act 39 is helping to improve the quality of end of life care through personal choice. However, the anticipated end of life is difficult for an individual to bear and the Act 39 limitations add to that stressful situation. The current text of Act 39 limits participation by registered pharmacists, which necessitates that the prescribing physician must sign an indemnity agreement in all cases. The result is that fewer physicians are willing to prescribe aid in dying to their patients and fewer pharmacists are willing to be involved. When we receive an Act 39 call, we must have the physician and the patient sign an indemnity agreement before we can move forward. This delay adds a level of stress to an already stressed situation. When the pharmacy receives the indemnity agreement, we call the patient to discuss the details of the prescription and arrange for me to deliver their medication. I do this personally. I do not mail the medication. Instead, I travel the state to hand deliver the medication and meet with the family and the patients. I spend time with the patient and the family to thoroughly review the medication, the instructions, and answer any questions. This duty requires knowledge, compassion, caring, and support. Supporting an individual who chooses to utilize Act 39 requires a healthcare team approach between the doctor, nurses, pharmacists, and families. All the participants in this healthcare team need to be protected and supported by the state of Vermont. Currently, only physicians enjoy that protection and support. Passing S-74 would remove the need for the indemnity agreement. It would allow more healthcare professionals to serve their patients' end-of-life care needs. The focus should be on meeting the patient's needs at this time, and it is not the time to be concerned about personal liability. Thank you for your consideration and support of Senate Bill 74, including the correction to the immunity provision of Act 39, which supports Vermonters in the end-of-life care that they choose. If you have any questions, please do not hesitate to reach out to me. Sincerely, Steve Hockbird, RPH, Smiling Steve Pharmacies, end quote. So that's his submission, and I'll make sure it, it gets to the committee, Madam Chairwoman. Um, in, in briefer form, I'm here to on their behalf and as their attorney in this indemnity agreement process that's been underway for a few years to say we wholly support the new Section C in 5285, which um, clearly um, includes a pharmacist uh, and protects other practitioners as well. Again, I'm here not selfishly, but on behalf of pharmacists, I'm not speaking for other healthcare providers, uh, but I, we, we think it will um, be a, 
using the way he described it, it'll take a stress point out of the process. And pharmacists and perhaps other practitioners will, I think, be more, if they're inclined to provide these services, uh, willing to do so. Um, I just might add that over these few years, I've had conversations with uh, general counsel from various institutions that have suggested that the indemnity agreement wasn't necessary. Uh, in the end, we didn't concur and have required an indemnity agreement uh, to date. Um, so we support this change to the language. I don't have any other comments here today. We're thankful that, uh, that you've taken this up and, and that, um, I think that's it, unless there are any questions, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, thank you. Uh, I am going to look around the room to see if there are any questions. So if I could just oh, add in close. Oh, sorry. Was there somebody? Uh, well, we have a question from. It's not necessarily for him. It's a general question. It's probably counsel can. Uh, okay, go ahead. Uh, or reading of the bill. <laughs> this has to do with. Of course, we're, we're trying to help people here that, are, that see no other way out of uh, a situation that they're in. Uh, and yet, my understanding is that the person himself has to inject this material. And what do they do in the case of uh, the AMS or you know, lateral sclerosis and all that? As far as I understand it, people become totally unable to move or do anything. They would not so be what able. What happens with, with people? They are not able to. They are not able to. Um, given given the, the law as written, um, they're not able to um, participate. Um, some some, uh, as I think the doctor said, uh, this law is um, it was passed. Um, it's a balancing act between um, providing access. Um, to those people who um, want to um, use medical aid in dying and to protect those who, um, and, and one of the balancing acts that has been um, done is that the person needs to be able to take the medication themselves. Yeah. And that protects, you know, it's a level of protection around um, no, I understand that. I'm just surprised that because people are trying to increase access, that hasn't been one of the asks that under some circumstances, somebody else could administer the, the, uh, the drug. Okay, I'm just, just curious because it seems like it uh, leaves out a whole segment of people that are in many cases probably more likely to want to use this to end their life than others. So just a comment. And we could we could probably have a long discussion about that and about the balancing between. Um, I'm not saying I'm for it. No, I know that. I, I know that. I know that. But in terms of in terms of ensuring that this is of someone's own free will, and that it is that they are doing it that way. Um, uh, Representative McFawn. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to I want to reinforce what you just said. Um, when this bill was passed originally, there was a lot of testimony around this subject. And this Sorry. is- Sorry, apologize. Call from the wireless cattle. Oh my gosh. Um, uh, Sorry. Uh, um, that's okay. <laughs> Let's go ahead, Topper. Um, well, I, I was just gonna say that there was a lot of testimony around this particular subject of the individual being able to take it themselves. Um, so that's this is where we ended up. Um, I, I just want to reinforce what you said. Thank you, Topper. Yeah. Um, we have, uh, um, let me, um, we can, let's have a discussion, but let me first, before we have more of a discussion, um, check to see if we have any Further questions for uh, Theo Kennedy. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you, Mr. Kennedy, for being here. Um, this question might be better suited to the um, 
Mr. Steve, who you read uh, the letter that he delivered, but um, just from a pharmacy's perspective, I'm just curious on a couple of these questions. Uh, the first one being, if you're able to answer just a little bit more about the you know, pharmacology of this medication, if you can provide any information on that yourself. And second of all, um, I'm curious about, we've heard of some cases in which an individual chooses not to administer the medication and wondering about the follow-up of that. I mean, it was promising to hear that uh, the pharmacist that you read the letter from was hand delivering medication. It seemed like a very involved process with the patient and the family. But um, I think that's a question that um, happy to hear that the uh, Mr. Steve gave his uh, invitation for us to reach out with any questions, but I was wondering if you could speak to that as well as a representative. Well, thank you for that question, Representative. I, I most certainly am not, <laughs> uh, but I'm very happy to uh, follow up and, and have Steve answer any more specific question, both on the pharmacological aspect and the question with regards to reluctance or choice not to at the point of administration. I, But those are important questions, and I apologize. That's not in my wheelhouse, uh, so I don't want to misspeak, um, but I'd be happy to follow up as, as quickly as, as reasonably possible. Um, that, that would be very helpful, and if you could um, put those responses in writing, and so then we can uh, uh, share them in our discussion and post them. Thank you so much. And if it were possible just to write them, I think I took notes as I was hearing them, but we certainly will try to do that promptly, Madam Chair. I just wanted to add one thing that, because um, it came up in the conversation with uh, the Assistant Attorney General, um, that you know we very much want the word compliance in that section and not reliance. I, I do think as just an ordinary practitioner, good faith is implicit in the law. I agree with that comment. I don't mind its use here. Uh, it's really not my role to have a position on that, but I think it's important that compliance be the word in, in the new section C and not reliance. It, as as um, legislative counsel, I think, indicated, it, there's a different section uh, than the what's currently 5285B, or will remain 5285B. Um, anyway, thank you for your time today. It's a lot of political courage to open this back up, but it's going to make a big difference for pharmacists who choose to participate to have this new language. And thank you for your work. Well, thank you, Theo, and you're welcome to stay on as we have a discussion, or if you have other things to do, um, we appreciate your time. Thank you, and have a good day. I'll probably go to off video and listen in. Have a good afternoon, a good morning. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Um, somehow I think I like interrupted a bunch of questions or perhaps, you know, um, or in the middle of a discussion. And when I said, hey, let's, wrap up with Theo first. And um, I've now lost the thread of where, what I interrupted. Well, I guess I brought up that issue of uh, somebody uh, other than the patient themselves rejecting uh, mm -hmm. the, the uh, drop. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. And doctor and you face a lot of discussion about that. I, I wasn't here. Yeah, right, right. And, and and, and that's why I, my time, right? <laughs> it was in the middle of your of non <laughs> I mean, I think you know, your your questions are, I mean, it's very important. So are um, Dane's um, that um, relate to um, the law as it was passed because you weren't here. And um, so how, you know, um, I, I think it's perfectly appropriate and helpful for, for, uh, for those who were not here for whom this is not um, something, even for those of us who were here, to um, understand what is what this is amending, um, and uh, you know. So I think that that's uh, yeah. I just I just wanted to say thank you for um, in, enabling us to sort of think about the totality because uh, it. Two of the rest of the committee wasn't here, so it's mm -hmm. it's helpful. Although I do remember coming to the public hearing um, mm -hmm. in my with my disability rights hat on and um, thinking about this it was um, you know at the outset very much opposed by disability advocates and 
um, for some of the reasons that sort of kind of like you were starting to get into, Carl, um, uh, other people, the fear of other people being able to um, um, to uh, give the drug, um, uh, the, the fear about the rights of people with disabilities and um, ability to have substituted judgment about that. So um, I uh, appreciate the way the law ended up being written. And um, uh, I, uh, you'll, you'll see posted from the Vermont DD Council um, that they have no concerns with the changes um, in, the, in the law as proposed um, amendments. And, um, you know, I, I feel like, um, I feel like this is uh, some relatively modest things that, that we can do to make, um, make things easier for people who are already making difficult decisions in their life um, and with their families and the people that surround them um, at that time of their life. So, um, yeah, I, I mean, I would not personally be in favor of changing anything with regard to other people being able to assist. Um, I wouldn't either. And I was here two years, you know, whatever. Um, I've been here since the beginning um, um, when it came, came to the floor more than once. Um, but I, th I think this at present time, this is it's an appropriate balance of um, free freedom um, and of free will uh, and protection. Um, and Can I ask a question if anybody else reads it the way I do or, or not or that the question I was asking about um, the position mm -hmm. and the and the um, let me see for the it's language here. Thank you. Page two. Um, and maybe it's just because it was in the context of seeing the cross out and then seeing, you know, then seeing the language, similar language reinserted. I think this the same okay. language. Yeah, it didn't seem it didn't seem to me to be clarifying. I don't know. I'm, I'm, like, <clears throat> me. I'm wondering if legislative council. Um, could, um, uh, wait, wait, just a second. There's multiple oh, yeah, yeah. people talking, and I'm just sorry. Uh, page two of the bill. We're talking about five A here, where it crosses oh, out physical I mean, examination as a patient, it's okay. and then <laughs> adds in <laughs> that's okay. the patient in the same. And, no, and so what um, I have just called legislative council to um, the witness chair because there's those three little dots, the ellipsis. So don't don't actually the ellipses don't matter in this oh. particular instance because we're really looking at the lead in language of the physician determined that the patient and then a is was suffering a terminal condition. And that is based on in an existing law. It's based on the physician's physical examination of the patient and review of the patient's relevant medical records. The change would be that the physician determined that the patient was suffering a terminal condition based on the physician's review of the patient's relevant medical records and a physician's physical examination of the patient. It doesn't have to be the prescribing physician, but it does have to be a physician's physical examination um, as part of what the prescribing physician is relying on to determine that the patient was suffering a terminal condition. So this goes back to then, Carl, your question to Dr. Barnard, and she was saying that the two um, can be uh, telemedicine, but there needs to have been at some point in time a physical examination. Separate from telemedicine or possible. <clears throat> right. Correct. All right, somebody has to have done a physical examination of the patient to determine that they are suffering a terminal condition. Cool. Um, Is that? I, I, yeah, I mean, I can read it. I, I, I read what it says. <laughs> um, uh, if, if, if I'm the only one that has that like question mark, then that it not I, being I, clear. That I had the question mark there, mm -hmm. but when you read the the piece of that simple, as we know, just one shift in, in language from the physician to a physician helps separate that piece of not having mm -hmm. it 
have to be the same physician, that there's a physician who determines the terminal illness, yeah. and then the prescribing physician can be a different provider. So that clarified for me, I would just say. Yeah, yeah. That's good. That's all I mean. Carl. Can I just follow up on Absolutely. that? Absolutely. Is your concern that it is not, now it does not have to be the prescribing physician? Uh, actually, an intimate I relationship that there might be between the physician and the patient. I want to say and about and I mean it's not. I know what you mean. I know what you mean. No, I don't have a concern. I don't have a concern about who the physician is who prescribes mm -hmm. um, the medication. I just don't want physicians to not be clear that it is not they who have to have a uh, physical presence with it and and everybody else seems to be clear about it it only seems to be you know a question mark for me i'm not at all concerned that um it's that the prescribing physician uh, that they're changing the requirement that the prescribing physician does not now need to physically see the person i um i uh you know really um believe that people be practicing their their um you know um uh, medical ethics. <laughs> ethics, right, when they're doing that. I mean, it was very clear to me, the people who specialize in end-of-life care um, are very um, in tune with evaluating people at that stage of their life. And, um, you know, I, so I don't have any problem with the change in that. I was just wanting to ensure that um, other physicians who maybe have not been as in tune or who have been hesitant to participate in the program. And this is about actually increasing <coughs> access to people um, by not having to hunt down a Dr. Barnard or, you know, another doctor who, um, you know, um, may be willing to do it, that they would see this as a, um, I want to make sure they don't see it as a barrier. That's all. Um, and that seems to be clear to everybody. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm good, Madam Chair. This will be important in close reading as to what is in, um, if, if we vote this out, what is put on the calendar and make sure that the, there's the uh and the the. Yes, <laughs> in, in the proper place, yes, yes. And somebody will ask you that question on the floor, Madam Chair. <laughs> Uh, and uh, no, they will say like, well, you just struck it out, and now you're putting it back in. Yeah, they will. They will ask you, even though I knew that that's not what was happening. Well, if I could, absolutely. Um, my concern when I was first reading this was what I was trying to get at with you, thinking you had the same concern I have, is that there there was that more intimate, or I'll even say, a relationship of the uh, of the doctor with the patient, and you know, doing. He's doing the physical and he's really part of this process. Okay. And now you're separate, taking one, one level of separation away from that. It, he's not the one that's actually doing or in all likelihood the physical exam. So um, that, that was just a concern of mine when I first read this. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, but uh, apparently, that's not a good uh, Yeah, I'm sorry. I don't, yeah. I, I, I think I was thinking actually. You were thinking. I, 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 I no, you thought I was like right there with you. I'm sorry, Carl. Um, but but I think this actually um, may help to address your concern because I think this for the physician who has the personal relationship but who has been reluctant maybe in the past, I think this this provides a, a more of an opening for that person. But you're still gonna have some physicians who who you know they're they are not going to want to do this and um but i i hope that they avail themselves of the continuing education opportunities and the training that's available and out there because you know it's really kind of heartbreaking to hear stories that we've i think everybody's gotten emails and stuff about you know the people who have you know their doctor said no their doctor that they had that personal relationship and and they thought that was the end of it and they didn't get any further information, and um, you know that was sad to me. Yeah. Do we um, need legislative counsel in the? Uh, let's see, you're feeling so free to stay. Um, a tapper. I'm. Uh, I'm wondering, Madam Chair, if it, we're at we're at number five, 
if we said the prescribing physician determined that the patient was suffering a terminal condition based on the phys that physician's review of the patient's relevant medical records and a physician's physical examination. It's not, they didn't have anything to do with the records and they didn't have anything to do with the physical examination, but they've reviewed all of that and they've determined that the person has a terminal condition. Um, I see, I'm now gonna, oh, I may have to consult people in the room or, um, Jen, I don't think the prescribing, this is not necessarily referring to the prescribing physician, the prescribing physician. Oh, it is the prescribing physician who's making the determination, but okay. they're referred to throughout this. I mean, the, the beginning of the section is that a physician shall not be subject to any civil or criminal liability or professional disciplinary action if the physician prescribes to the patient. And then it goes on and the, the physician documents in the medical patient's medical record that all of the following occurred. And then we're referring to this physician as the physician throughout. So I'd be concerned about starting to call them the prescribing physician without making that change throughout. Um, I think if there's interest in making this language different or, or clearer, we can look at doing that. Um, but I, I wouldn't want to introduce new terminology at yep. one place. You see what she's talking about there, Topper? That this I thought we were talking about the prescribing physician. I didn't think we were talking about just any physician. We are in all cases, except in this new language about who has done the physical examination of the patient, that the physician who is doing the prescribing is uh, basing their determination that the patient is suffering a terminal condition on. Yeah. He can rely, or the physician, I should say, okay, but the physician can, can rely on another doctor's Exactly. exactly. That's what this That's exactly what this is saying. Correct. Um I guess I want to um, sort of go back to um, what we're thinking of what we have, what I have um, tentatively um, scheduled in terms of some more information, some more testimony um, would be um, next week. Um, which is the first time they could um, come. Um, Sharon Toberg, who's the policy analyst from Vermont Right to Life, she's actually confirmed. The Department of Health, um, David Englander, um, and the, uh, Sarah Teachout from the Medical Society. Um, no, from Blue where? Cross. Blue Cross Blue Shield, I'm sorry. Sarah Teachout from Blue Cross Blue Shield. Um, uh, um, Willem Jewett's wife, um, as well as we are, um, um, uh, because she, um, the family, and then um, uh, uh, Mr. Um, John Gelmore, whose wife um, recently um, uh, utilized the procedure, and so that we could hear from people said they wanted to hear from family members and um, that kind of thing. So I believe that is, I mean, that's right now. Um, who I have um, reached out to based on the information that people said they wanted to have. Um, AG's office for the lawyer, um, that kind of thing. Uh, Topper. Uh, uh, Kyle talked about the life insurance. Maybe we need a statement from Financial Regulation Agency. Um, <clears throat> I can try to, um, I have gotten an email um, statement that, um, or an email response to um, a question that was um, uh, asked, and um, let me um, figure out whether a written statement or whether do you want her to come in? She's welcome to, she has offered to come in as well. Would you like her to come in, Topper? Um, I, I don't know if she needs to come in. If, if it's a simple question, is if, if somebody does uh, use this process, is their life insurance uh, negated? That's all, that was the question Kyle asked. 
don't think that's the question, if no. I may. Okay. That's what's already addressed in the statute. Right. right. The statute already says it has no this has no impact on somebody's life insurance. I think the question I understood from Representative Rosenquist was outside of the context of this, if a person dies by suicide, what is the effect on their life insurance? Correct. Policy? That is the question. Which I understood that this, no. they, the insurance was still in force if they used right. this procedure, okay. uh, which surprised me, quite frankly, but I mean, that's no, that, uh, um, we have a, a, a question from James. Really a comment, um, which is, a, is which is an interesting question. I understand where it's coming from, but because it isn't related to this bill, it's not relevant to this bill. I don't, we shouldn't be talking about that. Um, that's my opinion. I mean, I know offense, but like it doesn't, this bill, take, uh, the existing bill takes care of that issue in the context of what's happening based on this bill. What happens outside of the context of this bill is not relevant at all to what's happening in this bill. So only in the context of what constitutes suicide. Okay, I guess that's what I and and how why it's different. Okay, I mean that's the way I would. Um, that's, that's really the basis of my question. Uh, I, I guess I'm um, and I hear that and the policy decision that was made back when the law first was passed that utilizing this process is not considered suicide. And that was a policy decision that the legislature made. Understood. And uh, I'm not saying it was right or wrong. I'm no, just right. saying I, I just, uh, you know, and I think the rationale was they, they're already assumed to be at end of life. So, you know, it shouldn't really have any ultimate consequence on the payout of an insurance policy. I mean, that's the way I take it that it was rationalized. Okay. Right. Anyway, I'd be happy with just a written comment on whether uh, uh, suicide uh, by itself that life insurance would pay out given. And I think we get, so got a partial answer from the Attorney General's office because she said it all depends on the policy, I guess. I, I, mean, I, I didn't realize I thought pretty much that was a yeah. no no and almost right, the right. insurance policy. Um, I, think, I think it does all depend. And um, um, Carl, I'm going to take this under advisement because two of the members of the committee have sort of said this is your question. Well, interesting. Yeah. Um, uh, it's not related to what is before us. That's true. I worked with Representative Rosenquist and BFR to get an answer to his question. Can, is that, abs is that absolutely. Okay. Um, so you, you have sort of, I mean, I'm trying to let folks know where we are and hearing from who or what types of witnesses people want to hear. Um, and uh, Carl, you had um, earlier um, asked if we were going to hear from um, any religious um, folks. And my, I just want to repeat, um, um, I appreciate that answer and this is, um, we would have a laundry list of people coming in with different perspectives. Um, and I think this is one of those decisions. Um, if you are curious or wondering what your particular um, pastor or group um, uh, that you are affiliated with, I would talk to them because there's going to be even within certain denominations, there's not there's going to be a different perspective. Um, and I, I, yeah, I, you know, obviously the, the big problem with me uh, on this bill and the initial one, if I've been there to vote on it, mm -hmm. is basically uh, relative to your belief system uh, that many many people believe uh, you know uh, life is a gift from God, yeah. and that we should tamper with it, I guess, is the best thing mm -hmm. to describe. Okay. So I'm, obviously I'm having a hard time yeah. on this. Absolutely. Oh. I, 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 you know, I, and this is something um, I am not going to ask anyone to vote for this or to vote against it. I mean, this is something we have to decide for ourselves. Um, the only thing that I would say which may not be persuasive, um, is that um, this is 
making the existing what is existing law. Right, and that's what I'm wrestling with too. Work, is that I, in a way, it's but I go with this because it's making the existing law for those people who would avail themselves of it better. Okay. Right. Versus the fact that I'm opposed to the concept. Of exactly. It. Exactly. And um, so. So what I, I'm not hearing right now that folks want to hear from anybody um, else kind of thing. Um, Other than who you have, right? I mean, right, right. Yeah. right. Great lineup. Yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, um, there's some more in, you know, some individuals and in what, what I have, what I have done and they're all posted. People have submitted um, some written comments or that they've wanted to, and I've, you know, welcomed them all. Um, and uh, we post them. And we also, I, um, we, Royal We, Julie or I, <laughs> sends them out so that you get them individually. You don't have to, as a committee member, remember to go on the site. You will have gotten that on your email. So we have at this point, I, you know, received um, one or two um, people supporting it and a couple people not supporting the changes um, based on the same sort of place that you are coming from. I'm just saying that's my. Yeah, absolutely. That's my dilemma. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and the one factor, only apart from my belief system, but is, is discriminatory. Well, I mean, the initial law anyway. Uh, to not allowing somebody that is unable to inject it themselves to not be covered. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I, that, that to me is a you know big open question whether that it could be seen as discriminatory because many of those people are in the worst shape or, or I wouldn't say the worst shape, but they, they their desire to terminate their life might even be greater than somebody suffering from terminal cancer or something like that. Because they can't interact with the world at all. I mean, they're uh, either, uh, as I said, obviously they interact because they, they signed up for the process, but they can't do the final thing themselves. Okay. Anyway, just a comment. Yeah, no, abso um, absolutely. We have to wrestle with these and with the choices and the balancing of. Um, rights versus responsibility versus personal um, and uh, and protection, protection of people who are um, more vulnerable, more vulnerable perhaps to um, people, more vulnerable to um, perhaps states of uh, this is too hard. And so maybe not meeting the criteria around, more vulnerable to people persuading. Um, them um, and um, and perhaps more vulnerable for you know something happening yeah. that no, um, they don't that that was not their choice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, th th those are some of the, the things and good That's questions. Good um, where are any thoughts right now, or is where are we? Okay. Um, we are going to um, then um, break. We'll, we'll have lunch and other things and come back at 1.15 with a whole different um, subject. Um, I do hope, James, you're going to be here because it is um, um, an act relating to the interstate compact on the placement of children. Where else would I be? Well, I'm just saying, because in case you hadn't gathered, I really hope that you will be presenting this bill as an encore. I, I was picking up what you're putting down. <laughs> <laughs> um, and um, so that that is, um, um, I think, where we where we are right now. Uh, Topper, do you want to say anything before we uh, leave? OK, thank you. Thank you all very much. I, and, I would uh, just say one thing. Absolutely. Um, keep up the good work. You're Thank you, Topper. This, you're handling this very well. Thank you, Topper. I appreciate that. 